uh, hi everyone and I think this time I can say good morning to everyone because I think all of us are from uh, the part of the world that is still morning. Um, today we have uh, our last lecture is by um, Marga Vaida. Is my pronunciation correct? Marga? Correct, thank you. Okay, great. And uh, Bargov did uh, his PhD in MPIA in 2011, uh, MPIA Heidelberg in 2011. Then he moved to Leeds in UK from 2011 to 14. He was in Leeds. And then after that, he became a postdoc uh, fellow in uh, University of Torino in Italy. And uh, since 2017, so he is assistant professor in Indore University in India. Is my pronunciation of Indore correct or is it Indore? Yeah, yeah. yeah Indian Institute of Technology Indore, yes. Okay, great. So uh, it's an honor for us to have him and please, Bargav, time is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tara. And it's in fact uh, my honor to be presenting in Iran. Uh, this is the first time I'm presenting in Iran. And thank you, Tara, for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. And I welcome all the students. Um, so this time it's a very different. Usually when you do a workshop, you go and present in person. But the situation uh, in the world now demands that everything be online. So today um, I will be presenting uh, the last lecture of this uh, a wonderful uh, workshop that has been organized, uh, which is the virtual crash course on uh, numerical astrophysics. And I will be mainly covering the topics on numerical magnetohydrodynamics. So the way I have uh, designed this course, so let me share my screen because it's easier for me to... Um, um, Sarah, in case uh, the connection is weaker and you prefer me to do it on the um, uh, by by presenting without sharing the screen, then let me know. Okay. Uh, we see your uh, screen and it, it is shared, so it's uh, now great. If you want to uh, go by share screen, that uh, that works too. Thank I think, you. I think I think I think I prefer share screen then. Okay. So. Um, yep. Just before I start, I have a question about the break. Would you give the break yourself, or we should remind you at some no, point? No, or? I will just explain this. So okay. what we do is that the whole uh, lecture today would be divided into three to four parts. Um, and each part will be about 40 to 45 minutes, and after that, we will take a break. So the first lecture notes which I've uploaded is for the first two parts. And uh, I will basically take a break uh, at some stage, and then uh, we can go ahead uh, continue in that direction. And in the last two part, I will focus on uh, Pluto code, uh, the code that which I am a part of a development team. And uh, we will discuss uh, some essentials of uh, actually how to get started with Pluto code, how to use Pluto code effectively. And then in the last stage where we will have some open discussions on uh, various topics that I've covered and uh, some questions you can ask me at the very end. And we can also discuss some problems uh, with Pluto. And also I give you some uh, handouts and <clears throat> uh, working problems to do. Maybe you can uh, try it out in your exercise session also. So the first two lectures will be mainly on uh, 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 making you understand the main introduction about magnetohydrodynamics. I will introduce you the equation of magnetohydrodynamics and what are the certain preliminaries and not not notations. And then uh, uh, basically that will be mostly the first part where we will actually construct the um, MHD equations. And then uh, I will describe some strategy which is very much uh, in line with what you have studied in your first day uh, by Professor Klai who explained to you uh, how to solve numerical hydrodynamic equations. We will extend that technique, what we what he has taught you, even to magnetohydrodynamics. And then I will discuss in details what are the differences that exist or what are the additional things that one needs to incorporate when you want to study magnetohydrodynamics. So that will be covered in the second aspect of this uh, lecture uh, after the first break, where we will discuss about computational methods and different terminologies and the numerical approaches for MHD equations. <clears throat> 
and then in the uh, last uh, two um, last two sessions we will basically focus on pluto code and that uh, i will share subsequently so let us look at into some introduction about why why this workshop is such a necessity and why really you need to study magneto hydrodynamics so if you look at computational astrophysics or numerical astrophysics that what the workshop is all about basically it completely opens a new window to perceive uh, different astrophysical objects okay and uh, essentially uh, it helps you to study the system in continuum such as you can basically study various aspects like like uh, interiors of stars and planets exterior phenomena such as accretion disks winds and jets interstellar medium intergalactic medium and also cosmology so you basically can study at very very small scale in terms of astrophysics and very very large scales that is in terms of cosmology but there are certain things um, uh, where such a continuum sense uh, becomes um, very difficult to apply and in those cases also there are various techniques that have been introduced in computational astrophysics that can help us to address certain aspects of these problems for example if you want to study the equation of state of neutron stars or you want to study the crust of neutron stars a different technique has to be adopted than the standard uh, fluid dynamics techniques that we will be studying today uh, but i will not go in details on these various techniques but i'm just giving you a flavor of the different um, aspects of computational astrophysics because you have studied over this few days the various aspects for example you have studied uh, about the poisson solver yesterday and in before about the n body simulation so there are various methods in order to approach a problem and certain method works better than the other in in different scenarios so this is a very nice um, workshop which covers most of it so if you look at um, if you want to basically study astrophysical flows now we all know that um, most of these flows that i have depicted here which is a supernova remnant which is a tycho or a solar uh, coronal mass or astrophysical in age angel like sinus a where you can see the radio image you can also see the crab nebula and neutron star beautiful patterns of uh, a relative instability which we'll see here and we will discuss about this in our in our class as well and here you also have a micro quasar which is basically throwing out jets so all these phenomena which are absolutely present in astrophysics they have one thing very common that is one thing is that they are highly energetic most of them are super energetic and and they actually impart a lot of energy they give a lot of energy into the system so it is extremely important to study this uh, from the perspective of the energy input that they provide to their surroundings however the problem exists over here the problem is that all these systems are extremely complicated to study from simple analytical perspective because that they involve lot of different physical aspects uh, most of these uh, systems are plasma so they are completely ionized matter of electrons protons positrons and they consist of magnetic fields which is one of the most crucial ingredient to study astrophysics and today we will actually see how we can incorporate this magnetic fields and study these plasma processes in continuum and the thing is that because of this complex nature and interplay of various physical processes in these systems it is extremely crucial it is extremely important that we study these aspects from the numerical perspective rather than analytical perspective so today uh, the focus will be on teaching you some simple techniques not very sophisticated that you can actually develop over time but some simple techniques of how will you solve a standard magneto hydrodynamic equations and what goes inside these very very huge codes which you must have encountered in either in your study or through your supervisors or your or, or your teachers so what really goes into these codes is something which we will basically focus on but before we before we go into the codes it is important to understand uh, the physics behind how these equations are derived and what are these equations all about so um, i've just listed out certain different areas important areas of um, uh, applications um, which includes instabilities in astrophysical fluids convections in stars stellar oscillations astrophysical dynamos some of the terms you may have heard earlier some of the terms you may have not heard but there is the computational astrophysics covers a wide area of applications and therefore um, having a having such a workshop is extremely critical and crucial 
um, um, to make make us understand the the versatility of computational astrophysics. So huge uh, span of uh, astrophysical spaces can be covered uh, through through computational techniques. So if you basically talk about uh, a very basic model, so if I want to talk about an extremely basic model to study an astrophysical system, so uh, typically the system in which we are dealing with have extremely high uh, Reynolds number, which we will discuss is basically highly inviscid flows and they're compressible. Compressible means that the, uh, the density changes and it produces kind of shocks um, as they go on. They are inviscid, meaning no viscosity. You can assume viscosity uh, to be absent. And we will treat mostly in Newtonian framework, which is non-relativistic framework. So this is basic model is what we term as hydrodynamics or where uh, you basically study the evolution of uh, the velocity field, the density field, and the pressure field. So I will explain all these aspects. So this is typical hydrodynamics, and this is something which you have studied in your first day of the, of the, of the, of the workshop. Then comes an important aspect. It's basically about thermodynamics, because when you have pressure and density associated with it, you can actually relate them with something called as an equation of state. And that determines how these things are connected. So for example, if I take a system which has basically no exchange of heat, then I tell that the system is adiabatic. The temperature may change, but there is no exchange of heat between the system and the surroundings. So that's an adiabatic process. Or you can treat it like a leaky process or a radiative process where the radiation can escape the box. And therefore, the system can cool down and heat exchange is possible. So there are various ways of connecting pressure and densities. And that is actually governed by the equation of state. The second uh, important aspect, which is very, very crucial for the astrophysics perspective, is magnetohydrodynamics. Most of the sources which we have seen, most of them have magnetic fields present. In some cases, magnetic fields play an extreme <laughs> or neutron stars, where the magnetic field is enormous. And in certain cases, the magnetic fields may play only a passive role. Uh, and however, they are always present in, in astrophysical systems. When you talk about magnetic, magnetohydrodynamics, there are other non-ideal effects that come into place. So most of the time, so in this course, we'll only be taking into effects ideal, uh, ideal aspects. But then it comes also non-ideal aspects because of the uh, microphysical activity that happens between the different ionized particles. Uh, ionized particles and neutral particles. So non-ideal effects include viscosity, magnetic resistivity, Hall effect, ambipolar diffusion, and so on and so forth. So these are certain aspects which even the present day computational astrophysics tools actually um, yeah, tackle. And I'll, I'll give you a very, very brief uh, um, uh, flavor of how it is done in, in Pluto, but not going into details much. And then comes the beast, that is relativity. Um, now with this advent of, um, I am aware, I'm sure that you are aware of uh, the um, excellent uh, discovery by the LIGO team in gravitational waves. So everything has become, one needs to study from the general relativistic aspect and special relativity also becomes important. So basic models, basically what I have described here can also be extended to special and general relativity. and there are various codes that are now existing in the literature and in community that can tackle such kind of complexities. So these are these are essentially the different aspects which you can get from the um, uh, from the uh, from the computational astrophysics perspective. So if you take any code um, uh, which basically tackles all of these things, then you have these very nice terminologies like HD, which is hydrodynamics, ideal and non-ideal. Then you have RAHD, which is radiation hydrodynamics, or RHD. SRHD, which is special relativistic hydrodynamics. GRHD, general relativistic hydrodynamics. MHD, which is magnetohydrodynamics, ideal and non-ideal. Radiation magnetohydrodynamics, special relativistic magnetohydrodynamics, and general relativistic magnetohydrodynamics. And then if you include all of this into one, then you have general relativistic radiation magnetohydrodynamics. So this is basically the state of the art uh, when it comes to developing codes and, 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 and most of the codes and some of the codes basically tackle individual aspects or collection of aspects from all these flavors of astrophysical fluid dynamics that I've described here. 
So this is basically the state of the art right now. So before uh, we go into or jump into um, fluid um, computational aspects, it is important to understand <clears throat> where and how we can apply fluid dynamics or the other computational fluid dynamics or, or really the, the, nu um, the numerical magneto hydrodynamics, the way that we are learning. So it, what is the limitation first we have to understand and where it can be applied. So uh, just the simple basics of physics that I will uh, just describe here for two to three slides so that it's easier for you to understand. So actually what you deal is basically you define some sort of a size of a fluid element. So that is you define your system uh, because if you want to describe your system as a, as a continuum fluid, you will have to tell when that system is a continuum fluid and when it is not. So let us define the size of a fluid element which is defined as LFE. And the size of the fluid element should be small so that it is smaller than the length scale of the change of any relevant variable. So for example, if the density uh, rho, let's say in this case, the fluid variable is Q and gradient of Q. So basically, let's say the density rho and the rho changes over certain length L, the fluid element that we choose to represent that system basically should be much less than this change, than the length where this change happens. But it should not be very, very small. It should be large enough to incorporate large number of particles inside this in this fluid element. So this is so I'm describing an element uh, which is uh, which I define as fluid element. It should be uh, small because it can uh, do basically smaller than the length scale of your density change. But it has to be large so as in order to incorporate large number of particles because then only you will be able to collectively describe uh, that system because essentially when you uh, when you study any 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 system, you basically start from the basic principle and you study particle wise. But if you keep on, if you study, let's say the uh, the heating of a table or a steel rod from an atom perspective, it is extremely difficult to study. So one needs to uh, define some sort of and that's what we call the fluid element. So it should be small, but it uh, not small enough that uh, it should be large enough to actually incorporate. A large number of particles and most important and one of the most fundamental assumptions when we treat a system as a fluid is that it should be collisional which means that all these particles which are actually incorporated in these fluid elements should basically um, uh, should basically collide uh, frequently with each other that means that the fluid element length should be much larger than the mean free path of in individual particles so they, they actually collide with each other and therefore the system becomes collisional so these are the very important aspects which is required in order to study the fluid dynamics. So as I mentioned, um, you can also describe this from the perspective of time. Um, and, and, and essentially, collisions and fluid approach are very, very crucial. And that uh, as, is an underlying assumption when we derive these equations, which I will be describing <clears throat> about the MHD or even hydrodynamics from the first principle that is the the first principle is what you study is the kinetic theory of gases where you treat individual particles and molecules and study their system in totality like in phase space and so on and so forth where you define a density distribution function and and do all these kind of things uh, however when you do all this uh, and make all these assumptions about collisions and then you can actually end up with the equations of the fluid so this is basically the fluid approach in which you assume that there are a lot of collisions which are happening and once one achieves a sort of a Maxwellian <clears throat> distribution function which defines for, for one particular temperature. So this is where the fluid approach is applicable. In case where the system is such a way that the, flu the length scale of the fluid or the characteristics time scale is longer or, or comparable to the collision time scales or the mean flight between the microscopic time scales then the length scale becomes equivalent to the mean free path and the fluid systems cannot be applied directly over there so this is a, this is a limitation where our fluid approach fails okay so here is simple uh, <clears throat> so <clears throat> here are simple examples of where the fluid approach wins and fluid approach fails for example you can take the core of a sunlight star is a typical density in temperatures and you can compute the mean free path and you can see that the mean free path is of the order of 10 to the power minus 8 centimeters whereas the size of the core 
the lens scale of the core is much much bigger and therefore when you treat the lens scale of the core of the sun you can very well apply uh, your um, your fluid approach uh, there is absolutely no problem but in certain cases like the ism uh, molecular cloud or the solar corona <clears throat> the mean free path you can estimate you can find out doing some simple calculations and you can see that this mean uh, the mean free path will be almost equivalent to the lens scale of the system and um, <clears throat> and then the fluid approach doesn't work and it fails so in these cases the single fluid approach which basically combines the electrons and protons uh, together uh, fails and one needs to basically go into a slightly more <clears throat> different approach which is multi fluid where you treat ions and electrons separately or hybrid models and um and and solve this system so the the uh, the numerical techniques for these kind of multi fluid and hybrid models are slightly different though on similar lines but it involves slightly different equations and different techniques i will not go into details of this neither i will go into details of what are the kinetic approaches to solve the boltzmann equation from the first principle we will focus mostly on single fluid uh, ideal mhd equations and how to solve them so basically we are assuming that our system can be solved based on fluid um, um, based on fluid approach or fluid approximation but this is to just to give you a flavor <clears throat> so let's begin i think this is something which you have already discussed uh, in the hydrodynamics class so i'll quickly go through it uh, but just this is for my uh, for my um, reference because i'll be following the same notation throughout so uh, the most symbols uh, when you describe a fluid you describe the fluid based on different variables so the basic variable is the velocity which is the rate of change of a fluid element displacement of a fluid element which is defined by v so all the vector quantities in my talk are basically bold and all the scalar quantities are essentially unbold um and so for example if i take a cartesian coordinate i can define a velocity field which is basically a v which is a function of x y z and t the t is a time and you can define additional variables like specific volume one by rho temperature which is proportional to p by rho and current density which is proportional to uh curl of t um there are two different viewpoints in order to study the fluid the first viewpoint is that you stand as a reference frame and you see the fluid move so that is an eulerian viewpoint where essentially you are essentially seeing the fluid moving in front of you from a static uh, reference frame or a lagrangian viewpoint a lagrangian viewpoint means that you basically are sitting on the fluid particle and seeing how this fluid particle is actually moving in in combination with the other fluid particles so there are two different uh, aspects and if i want to describe a change of any quantity q be it velocity or pressure or magnetic fields in an eulerian viewpoint then basically i define something called as a partial derivative which is del q by del t and if i want to describe the the same system or the same quantity from the lagrangian viewpoint then i basically define my derivative as capital dq over capital dt which is actually related to the uh, the de partial derivative from the eulerian viewpoint plus a convective term which is actually v dot del of q so these are this is something which you have studied in the first class as well and i'm just basically going through because it will be needed in when we derive these equations so these are the two different viewpoints and and we will take up these variables to actually get the uh, equations slightly more vector calculus for people uh, just to get uh, because it's early morning 9 915 so i think it's better to get uh, pumped up with some uh, mathematics so if for any variable denoted by q which is a function of x y and z its partial derivative is uh, del q over del t this is how i define the partial derivative you can define a gradient of any scalar as uh, phi x uh, which with subscript x subscript y subscript z which are basically nothing but del phi over del x del phi over del y del phi over del z you can also define a divergence operator for any vector quantity uh, which is essentially nothing but uh, yeah so um, del a by uh, x cap uh, a2 by so a1 a2 and a3 are the components of the vector a so um, essentially um, yeah so grad phi is a vector and divergence is a scalar and this is essentially how you define simple definitions of gradient and divergence 
there is an another important aspect which i would like to focus on and this is essentially simple the first simple product is called the inner product or the dot product of two vectors so if i have vectors a1 a with components a1 a2 a3 and b with b1 b2 b3 then i know that the dot product is a scalar quantity which is a1 times b1 plus a2 times b2 plus a3 times b3 but you can also define something called as an outer product um, which is essentially uh, nothing but the um, um, uh, you write it as a, a matrix multiplication of the vector and its transpose so then you basically get so if i have a vector a1 a2 a3 and then multiply with b transpose essentially you will get this uh, a complete matrix um, which is essentially called the outer product and this is extremely important so for for example if i want to get an index notation of ij of this outer product then it is ai bj okay so that is essentially how you describe an outer product so this is very important because we will be uh, treating this this kind of things right so um, let us uh, quickly go in through how to basically derive this uh, mhd equations because this has fundamental equations which we'll be using to solve them it is important you know how they are actually derived um so uh, essentially when you try to derive the magneto hydrodynamic equations you know that there is a system of hydrodynamic equations which you have already studied so this is basically set of conservation laws the first equation on the left panel conservative form of ideal hd equation is essentially uh, the mass conservation equation and then uh, you have the momentum conservation equation which is essentially uh, the second equation and finally is the total energy conservation equation so you have the three equations the mass conservation momentum conservation and total energy conservation now these are the standard conservative form of ideal hydrodynamic equation there is no viscosity or any other non ideal effects and here i is the identity matrix e is the total energy which is the sum of kinetic and internal energies and p is a scalar pressure so here we'll assume the pressure is scalar quantity um and uh, and it's is same in all three directions so uh, uh, ideally pressure is so this is a standard hydrodynamic equations and then you will have to look into a system of equations which you already know that describes the fields that is essentially electric and magnetic fields so the system of equations that describe the electric and magnetic fields is the very well known as maxwell's equation and here are the maxwell's equations that i have written down in vacuum i have used gaussian units because this is typically what we use for our uh, computational astrophysics perspective most of them uh, they try to use it in cgs units very few uh, codes actually do in si units but so I, for the consistency since pluto uses gaussian units i have used gaussian units over here um so the four equations are very well known divergence of e and divergence of b zero this is a very important that no mono magnetic monopoles exist you basically have um, the ampere's law and the the faraday law and uh, the, that describes the curl of e and curl of p and here there we have introduced two quantities one is j which is the current density and another is q the capital q which is called the charge density so these are essentially uh, quantities uh, uh, these are uh, quantities which are um, which describes the system so if i basically combine these two in, in under certain approximation then what i get is essentially the ma the magneto hydrodynamic equations so let us combine these two equations these two sets of equations under certain assumptions so what are those assumptions right so if i want to basically as i said since most of the system is in plasma and you want to study individual electron or individual proton you will need to do what you will need to do is you will need to study the motion of this charged particle in presence of electric and magnetic fields right but this is absolutely impractical from the perspective that you have millions and billions of uh, charged particles that are describing your system so that's why we need to assume the collisional limit and single fluid approximation that is what i was describing and we can treat this whole system as a quasi neutral where there is no distinction between electrons and ions for deriving the standard mhd equations and the collisional means that uh, as i described that the collision of these electrons it, it may not be physical collisions but interaction due to coulomb interactions uh, happens at a much much smaller length as compared to the length scale of the system and the length of the fluid element as well right so uh, this is basically uh, 
the assumptions that are go for the standard single fluid assumptions. But when it comes to MHD approximation, one important aspect that we touch upon comes from the Ohm's law. So in general, the Ohm's law is given as the current density is conductivity times the electric field. So for example, if I take uh, the plasma in the rest frame, uh, basically has it, and and define this uh, Ohm's law, J prime is equal to sigma E prime, where E prime is with, with the prime coordinates in the plasma in the rest frame. What I actually assume in my ideal MHD system is that the sigma, which is the conductivity, has is infinite or is very, very large. And that is very, very, uh, um, this approximation absolutely valid for most of the systems because the conductivity in at least a solar corona and all, this is extremely large conductivity. So one can assume that sigma is extremely large. And the fact that since you have a finite current going on, J prime in the system, in, in your plasma rest frame, this indicates that the electric field in the plasma rest frame can be actually taken to be uh, zero. So what it means that whenever there is some separation of charged particles uh, which generates electric fields, it will be immediately shocked because of there is so much density and so much collision happening that you cannot really separate out these charged particles. So that is that is physically what this assumption means. So in the rest frame, the plasma rest frame, the electric field is essentially zero. So if I now transform from the uh, plasma rest frame to the lab frame, uh, where I define my Lorentz factor gamma, so I have this transformation and I know that this E prime can be approximated to zero, then my electric field in the uh, in the lab frame can be very easily written as minus one over CV cross V. Now this is extremely crucial from the perspective of um, uh, of writing the uh, this thing. So this tells you that now my electric field is not a separate quantity or a separate entity, but can be very easily represented by V, v cross P. So this gives you a very nice uh, conduct, uh, that basically gives you a very nice uh, um, uh, relationship between the electric field and the, and the magnetic field. So under this approximation, um, now we can look at this. We can write this E, replace this E, and we can actually get the induction equation, which is basically known as del B by del T is equal to curl of V cross V. Now this curl of V cross V, if you are uh, good in vector identities, you can actually write it down and in, 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 in expand it. And you can actually show that this, uh, the del B by del T can be written as a divergence of a quantity. And this is extremely crucial because from the perspective of writing the equation in the conservative form. So this is basically how you write the induction equation under this MSD approximation. And the most important approximation is that you have infinite conductivity. This is ideal approximation. So ideal MSD approximation. Now, what are the consequences of this? I mean, you, you have definite consequences of this. So the point, as I was describing, you can actually dis neglect completely the electric component of the Maxwell stress. Because at that, especially for non-relativistic case, where because the electric component of the Maxwell stress now is much smaller than its magnetic component uh, of the order of V square by C square. And also you can actually neglect the displacement current. This is del E by del T in the Maxwell's equation. This, this term can be easily neglected because you can show that the ratio of displacement current to the curl of the magnetic field, which is essentially this. So ratio of this displacement current, one by C, this thing with regards to this is, is much, much smaller and is of the order of V, V, V is the basically the flow, uh, flow velocity and uh, by C square. And so this can be neglected. And this gives me another very important relation from MHD perspective, which is essentially the relation of current density with regards to the curl of P. So there are two very important uh, 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 formulation which relates the electric field in the lap frame with V cross B and the current density as curl of P. <clears throat> now with these two, um, with these two um, um, equations, we can actually write the Lorentz force that is actually happening in the uh, uh, Lorentz force that is acted upon um, will be and that will be incorporated in the momentum conservation equation it's just j cross b 1 by c j cross b and this can be written down as just replacing j as by this 
you can write it down as curl of b cross b and this can be very well written down as, as this thing by just by vector identity the first term here this is essentially called the magnetic tension force so this is essentially the magnetic tension and this is very important because it really shows you how so you can think of magnetic fields as rubber bands and when you basically stretch you can kind of create some kind of a tension force in order for the rubber bands to come back so this can be thought as a tension force that can actually happen and the second term is essentially called the gradient of magnetic pressure term so this is happening because for example in certain place you have very high magnetic pressure in certain place you have very low magnetic pressure since the material flows from uh, in 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 thermodynamics or in hydrodynamic perspective material flows from high pressure to low pressure the same thing happens here the flux flows from high pressure to low pressure uh, high magnetic pressure low magnetic pressure and this is essentially the term governing that gradient of magnetic pressure so the lorentz force can now be broken up into two aspects one is the tension force and the gradient of magnetic pressure so this is very crucial aspect and and the most important or another very important aspect of the property of your ideal mhg system with infinite conductivity is the flux freezing a flux freezing means that our magnetic flux which i define as b dot n da essentially this is uh, the magnetic field um, you know, passing through a certain area element uh, with the direction vector n hat that flux remains completely conserved so it doesn't change with time and that is the consequence is that if i basically have a plasma attached to a magnetic field wherever the plasma moves the magnetic fields are kind of dragged along uh, with them so this is this is the fundamental of uh, mhd approximation which is essentially infinite conductivity so now with this uh, background we can <clears throat> very well uh, write down the equations of magneto hydrodynamics um, which is essentially you have the mass conservation equation which is given by this which is same as the hydrodynamic equation you have the momentum conservation equation you can see now that you have uh, the, the the terms these are essentially in the conservative form now just to remind you a conservative form involves del by del t of some quantity q and divergence of the flux of that quantity which is in this case is rho v so you can see all these equations are written as del by del t of some quantity and a divergence of another quantity Okay, so that is essentially what is called as a conservative term, uh, the conservative uh, form. So here you can see the momentum equation basically has these two terms. This is corresponding to the pressure and this is corresponding to the tension. Because as we saw that the Lorentz force actually have two terms, the tension part and the pressure part. And they are actually now incorporated here. The total energy now <clears throat> has additional component which is coming uh, due to the tension part and also due to the magnetic pressure part. So here basically can have uh, this kind of uh, expression over here so this is the flux uh, in the total energy equation and then apart from momentum mass and energy conservation you have additional equation which is essentially called the induction equation and this is what we have derived assuming some mhd approximation so now instead of three equations which you were solving in hydrodynamics we solve four equations but most important is that we have this extremely important constraint which is called the divergence of B to B C O, and that comes from the Maxwell's equation. So these are the set of five, four equations with one constraint: the divergence of B cannot be uh, uh, non-zero. This complete set is called an ideal MHD set of ideal MHD equations, and how to solve them is basically what we will study. Uh, as I said, that the electric, the total energy is basically internal energy plus kinetic energy plus the magnetic energy. Or the b square by 2 is magnetic energy and um, uh, sorry for the this wrong uh, change in rotation this is the electric field is minus b cross b um, and and the current density is just curl of b so uh, please note that in in most of the cases we take the c as uh, just for completeness but typically uh, c is taken to be uh, in scale of 1 and and please note that in computational astrophysics and most of the computational codes my b is written in terms of b physical over square root of 4 pi so that's why you do not see any 4 5 4 pi factors which we were seeing earlier here they are actually gone because they are kind of incorporated into these magnetic fields 
So that's why you have this b square over 2 instead of b square over 8 pi. So please, please note that important aspect. So these are the, the basic equations of magnetohydrodynamics. So uh, just to um, give you, uh, sorry, a closure relation. Uh, so this is the complete set. And this is how you write the total energy equation and the induction equation. But what is missing in this case is how do you relate pressure and density? And that is where the equation of state comes into play. And that basically tells us how the um, equation of state, how the basically pressure and density are kind of related. So there are various equation of state, which is the ideal equation of state <clears throat> or the calorific ideal equation of state. And uh, here you can see this is P over gamma minus one by rho. This is basically how you write the internal energy. And one can define something called as the sound speed, which is nothing but square root of gamma p by rho. So this is how you define the sound speed of the system. So this is something uh, of critical of a thermodynamic system. It relates, and gamma is essentially called the adiabatic index. For a monoatomic gas, you can take gamma to be 5 thirds. It's a, just a ratio of specific heats, um, Cp over C, right? So <clears throat> when you, um, and when you look at, so, so so sound speed is the fundamental wave that exists when you perturb a hydrodynamic system. So if you perturb a density, you actually generate a wave in the system which is called a sound wave. And that moves with the sound speed. But when you take a, a magnetically high, um, MHD system and you perturb it, right? When you take a MHD system and you perturb it, you get different kind of waves which are essentially called as, which can be divided into two parts. One is called the Alphan wave and one other called is the magnetoacoustic waves. Now there are two different aspects that are slightly more complicated than the simple sound wave. So the Alphan wave, uh, the property of the Alphan wave is that it's a transverse wave and it's non-compressive. Which means that it's essentially equivalent to like a, you take a string and then you move a string up and down. Essentially a wave goes along the string and this is exactly what happens to the magnetic fields. If the magnetic field line is a string and you put up the string, uh, the the wave will actually go along the magnetic field and it will move with the velocity which is given by ca which is b over so this is basically and its direction is always along the magnetic field but then there are other two types of uh, magneto acoustic waves they are called the fast and slow magneto acoustic waves and they are given by this uh, expression over here where uh, C0 is basically sound speed and CA is essentially the alpha speed and psi is the angle between the direction of the propagation and the magnetic field. So these are essentially another waves and they are compressive waves. So essentially when I say compressive waves, whenever this wave moves into the system, it has a potential to produce shocks. It's the same like sound, sound wave in a, in a hydrodynamic system because if, if I move, if my velocity moves with more than sound speed, you have supersonic flows and you will have shocks. So you you can always have super fast and super slow um, flows which, which can actually produce shocks. Okay, uh, Whereas alpha waves really do not produce any kind of shocks. They are non-compressive. Right? So, um, yeah, so just a last couple of slides before I, I stop here. Um, as I was describing, um, when you treat the MHD system from the ideal perspective, when you assume infinite conductivity, you actually uh, are in an ideal limit. But in certain astrophysical scenarios, for example, be it uh, accretion disks or sometimes in molecular clouds, when you want to study molecular clouds, um, you have some sort of <clears throat> um, non-ideal effects. So the conductivity is not exactly infinite or it's not very large. And the neutral particles or let's say molecules can actually slip across the magnetic fields. And in that case, one needs to incorporate several other aspects which is essentially the resistivity or the hall effect and uh, um, and 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 you can write down now the um, the electric field which was just minus v cross b 1 over c v cross b with additional terms which is eta by c j and this thing so these are the two terms which can be added if i want to include resistivity and hall mhc terms and these have been included in pluto code i will not go in details of it but this is, uh, this is, um, so with this addition, you actually change the induction equation and the energy equation. And then you have to ap apply the computational techniques that we learn to solve, solve that system accordingly. So ideal MHD, as I said, only has uh, this particular one term 
that is existing this term is not present this term is absolutely not present this terms come into play when you actually assume that your um, conductivity is not infinite and um, and then you have to incorporate the resistivity effects right so in totality yes yeah, so in totality you have uh, a general framework of equations uh, which uh, which i wanted to describe um so this is basically the set of equations that uh, pluto code solves uh, most of it and there are additional more more equations but i just would like to highlight that all the equations that we will be solving even for mhd basically have this kind of form which has del by del t of u plus divergence of f of u equal to s and del by del t of u is u is some quantity which is basically a conservative quantity or a conservative vector divergence of a flux which is a function of this conservative vector and some source term s okay um and uh, <clears throat> you basically have uh, for the standard uh, equations you will have u to be rho rho v uh, total energy magnetic fields and rho xi which is essentially some chemical components and these are the different source terms that are actually present and this is di the different flux so this is basically the set of equations that are there we will mainly focus on the ideal mhd equations and uh, um, and only focus on uh, you know, like simple ideal mhd equations but i just wanted to show you the flavor of the various equations that are there and these are essentially how you write them in a very compact form so we can now uh, take a break at this juncture where we have uh, just to summarize we have introduced this set of uh, mhd equations and we will now try to see the techniques that we can use to solve them um, uh, through pluto code and and any other code so this will basically uh, be my first break and uh, i'll stop here um yeah thank you very much uh, bargo yeah for your thank great you. talk thank you. I see there are some chat here, but I would request uh, if we can actually hold the questions at least in the after the first two, two sessions. Okay.